<laughs> really quick, and I'm, I'm just doing a demo, I'm not, I'm not going to present any slides. It's a little bit of a I jumped the gun there. Yeah. Um, Wakata's been in business for about 11 years. We have over 250 OEM, ODMs using our technology in their, in their devices. Our VPN client is called TVPN, used by six of the top seven Android handset makers, including Samsung. So we estimate that we'll be in about 500 million devices this year. So we're the, they're the company that no one knows about that's all over the place, apparently. But, uh, uh, but I'm here to talk to you about a, a little, my brainchild, which was we sell SDKs. And a few years ago, we had app developers approaching us wanting to license our SDKs to use within their apps. And the issue was that they were misusing them. And, we, and I was very concerned as the CTO of the company that they would go and there would be a breach. There would be some sort of attack, and then they would say, oh, Makana, they, they don't know what they're doing. They, they write horrible security software. And so it was out of that sort of need, I think this is probably sort of the same need that the 3D printers are filling these days with people printing guns on their stuff. They're a little bit worried about those things, is how can we solve that? So I came up with this approach whereby we can automatically inject security into a finished app without any source code level changes. And uh, so I'm, I want, and I can talk about in great detail. I have 15 minutes, but uh, there's drinks afterwards too. So you can get it out of me too, how we do things. Drinks. <laughs> so what do I mean by adding security? We can add these 13 policies to any app. We're adding about one to two new policies per month. So we're, we've solved the, really the hairy, difficult problems first. And the first difficult problems were around data rest encryption, making sure that all of my app data that's being persistent device, there's lots of ways persistent data, is protected and uniquely protected to that app. So that's, there's a little bit of difference there. Now, if I do device-wide data rest encryption, <coughs> Typically, all devices have the same key, and that's when I have a problem, because any app that's residing on the device can access anyone else's data. And we saw this attack with the PlayStation 3, for example. That was an issue there. Now, the other is, um, and, and so when I say any data, there's explicit data. So let's say in my app I wrote for the coders, the one, one out of three here, I have F open, F right, F close. What we're able to do is to catch those kinds of operations, those explicit operations, and make those secure. But also the implicit operations. Let's say that I'm using a WebKit-based component within my app, it's going to be saving cache web pages. It's going to be saving my history. And the history may have cookies. It may have information sensitive within it. Certainly the cache pages do. I can uniquely encrypt that to that, that component as well, to that app. Um, additionally, a lot of the attacks against mobile have been around data and transit. So as I'm, uh, this app is communicating, I think I'm connecting to the Starbucks ho Wi-Fi hotspot, and I'm not, I'm a, to a, a attacker. Or I'm using my phone as a hotspot to tether my laptop. Anything that's connecting to the hotspot now can provide the device-wide VPN back to the enterprise, to the green zone of your network, and attack you. So this, what we're able to do is have a, add a VPN to the app itself that's unique to the app, so only that app now has VPN connectivity back to the enterprise, and we're able to send UDP and TCP traffic over that <coughs> VPN tunnel, including DNS queries. So even my DNS, I don't have to use a public DNS server for that. So I'm just going to jump right to start wrapping apps, because what people want to see, I think. So here's my Android apps. And there's parity between the Android and iOS. I'll switch to iOS. It's People even like that one a little bit more. And I'm going to go use Dolphin. This is a popular enterprise browser. And so the size of the app you'll see is 6.49 megabytes. I haven't done anything to it. And now I'm going to start adding security to it. So I can put an app expiration, say for a contract worker, the app will be valid within this period of time. When that contract expires, I can have the app kill itself and wipe all of its data in the process of doing that. Or I can put the app in a locked state so I can renew the contract and the worker can continue on if I so choose as IT. I can do secure copy and paste, so the app can only copy and paste within the app, but not out of the app into Gmail, the app, for example, for, for great for BYOD environments. I can do geofencing. We uh, do two target markets we first work with, with DOD and financial services, so you can kind of guess which ones are DOD and which ones are financial services. Uh, <laughs> Encrypted data rest will get turned on automatically when we turn on 
VPN. VPN obviously is important. I want to make sure this is going to securely connect back. This is a browser app, and I can make it so it's only intranet browser, so I can't go to Facebook, I can't go to anything other than I can only use it for work purposes if I so choose to do that as an IT administrator. I can do geo, obvious, uh, geo obfuscation as well. I think I might have skipped that, but geo obfuscation, uh, basically pick a location on the map that says I'm located here in Alaska, or random location, which most likely you're going to show up in the ocean. Uh, being that the, uh, with a random location. Um, the VPN, I can say, I want all my traffic from this app to go back to my San Francisco VPN server. If the user's been idle for 40 minutes, I'm going to require them to log back in. And if they fail to log in after eight attempts, I'm going to wipe the data. I'm going to have the ability to wipe the data on demand. So this is kind of mean. Banks love to be mean, though. But you can dial it down to be nicer to users if you want. Just log in. Eight tries is a lot of tries. <laughs> even eight, yeah, eight, maybe two, seven too many, right? So uh, but you can dial that down even. Uh, you can set the password complexity. And this is another one. People love this. Um, the, the, the length of the passphrase, uh, how often you have to change the passphrase, the complexity, all of that. We can also do for DOD and for other applications, you can do, we use a smart firewall. So we can also make sure that everything's double encrypted. So we're using an IPC <coughs> tunnel on the outside, and we can then ensure that the SSL connection is also encrypted on the inside. So if you do a plain text TCP socket, we'll firewall that. If you do plain, if you do UDP other than DNS queries, we'll firewall that as well. So you can go absolutely nuts as, as much as you want as an IT administrator. It gives you all this wonderful power. But the, the outcome is that the end user doesn't know this is happening. It's the apps they love, because you can take an, an ordinary app they love, their favorite app, and make it secure to your security baseline. That's the difference here. And then we can even make it FIPS certified. Some people like that. And then, um, and this is how long it takes to make the app secure, and with all of that. So you can think about that in terms of how long it takes to untar something, or un to unzip the, the SDK, and to manually integrate that in, at pound and clue, change your APIs, and we're done. That's how easy this is to make modifications to an app. I can tweak this. I can do different policies for different users, contract workers, for my executives, for my rank and file, however you want. You can just go nuts. There's enough policies here that you could actually make a different policy for every person within your organization. If you so choose to do something that crazy. But it gives you that power. Uh, the front end for the technical people is all Ruby here. We have this interface back to a JSON interface, so you can take that and integrate it into your own app, into your own, uh, if you have your own internal app store, or your own internal systems you want to run this through, you can do that. It has to give you that sort of capability. We have a 100-page document that describes that API. You, it's, it's 100 pages because we have lots and lots of, it's very robust and we have lots of sample data. It's, it's trivial if, you, if you're into JSON, you'll just love this. So I, I can go a little bit more, but is there any questions? Yes, please. How does this differ from like Mobile Iron and AirWatch and all the other uh, mobile application management? Good question. So there, I look at this as MDM 2.0. So MDM 1.0 was about just nuking devices, and it was really around also employer-owned devices. This is around BYOD, so you're able to use this for any of these apps uh, that you want. Um, so you're, you're managing the app versus the device. And with how we've taken the written the software, because we do a lot of work in the DoD, uh, my team does secure voice, for example, applications. Uh, we take the approach that we don't trust the environment, that we don't trust the device. And so we have that sort of mindset when we're developing the software to protect your, your data, your enterprise data, as part of that. So we're focused more on securing the apps. Now that we do have competitors, um, it seems like every day there's a new competitor. And, uh, and so it's, um, what we find is that they don't pass pen testing. So the last pen test we did with a major bank, uh, this was a well-known brand who competed against us in this account. They had over 25 pages of high-risk items, and their product did not work on Android at all. And our product came back with only two low-risk items, which we addressed in one sprint. So we are continually looking at the product, making it better, making it stronger. Do you have a function to stop screenshots? I notice a lot of Mac users, they like to do screenshots of stuff they're not supposed to, and then send it around to the internet. So this, can this stop the device from getting the screenshot? So there's two different kinds of screenshots. There's an, there's an implicit screenshot where Apple has this little trick. When you put an app in the background to switch, it will take a screen grab, and any app running on the device is able to see that buffer 
and grab that. And that happens all the time. You think about in your workday how many times you push the home button, there's a screenshot happening each time you do that. Because why Apple does that is that when you relaunch the app, it shows that as it catches back up. So you'll see that on some games, you'll see that it'll, it'll show that the static screen and then all of a sudden it'll engage and start, the gears will start moving again. And so um, we, we can block that one. We'll put a blank screen on that, on the screen grab. We know how to do it. It's not in this version yet. We have, we have partially two. Someone will say, well, the next issue will be someone takes another device and then points it at it. I can't do anything about that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe in the 3.0 of a laser come out. Just a quick one. So maybe I missed the earlier point. This dolphin is your app or is it a no, this is off the shelf app? No, this is off the shelf app. So all of these, so we can go back and look at other apps. These are all off the shelf apps. I don't have any source code level access to these, and I can make these apps secure to your security baseline. And you could then pay collect the, the, the native email and... I can't do anything in native apps because they're built into the firmware, so I can't modify them. They're... they're you, you, yes. you can still secure it, though. Can't you encrypt the data at rest in the native email and things like that? No. No, not correctly. No. Yes, yes. Does this depend in any way on the uh, device not being jailbroken or hacked at all or just maybe running on an emulator? Well, it will, um, we do different things to protect it against uh, being on a jailbroken device to detect that from occurring, but uh, we take the approach that we try to make sure even if it's a jailbroken device, it's going to be secure. But it's much more difficult, obviously, a jailbroken device than a non-jailbroken device. None of the tools, MRAT or any of those can detect our jailbreak detection methods. Now, that's not to say it's a, it's a cat and mouse game, anyone that says that, and it's a, it's, it's, um, there's a, there are other things that we're doing to deal with that so that we'll be able to quickly respond and change how we're detecting that in the future. Um, two questions, I guess. One is, how does your end user who brings in their own device now get this? Are you publishing back up to the app store, or? Yeah, there's two different ways. Um, so this is a console that makes the apps, hardens the apps. You can download the app. Uh, when you go to the app page, you can download. I'll just go back to it to show you that whole process here. <coughs> There's a download button. You can take that and then upload that into your app store. Or you can upload it to Apple B2B store, for example, um, or Google Play. Now, um, we have this, as, a, as, a, as I mentioned earlier, as a, a, REST, as a um, JSON RESTful API sort of approach built integrate to this. You could have your app store automatically wrap it. So sort of look at your identity and say, okay, this person's this and, and that. I'll apply this security policy in as they're downloading the app automatically to have that. Because you saw the approach, it takes about two seconds to wrap an app. Again, the second question is from your policy aspect. If you detect that something is jailbroken, you're able to start shutting down. Yes, yeah, so we have this protocol, it's a very cute name, I might get in trouble for mentioning this, but it's called PERP, and it's, uh, and basically it gets, you can get telemetry data out of an app and different information out of the app back to the, to the enterprise, and the enterprise then can say, send a kill command automatically. So the device is, was, is expected not to be jailbroken or rooted, and it comes in the text it has been, you can then send a kill command to the app. Okay. How do you see like, companies like uh, HP Vericode uh, in the marketplace? Do you compete with them directly head to head? Or they're partners. HP is actually a partner of ours. Um, the big announcement was uh, last week was SAP is a um, is reselling our product now. Uh, so that's it's they're calling it. That has to be terrible. <laughs> that's that's we're kind of sleep for days. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, it's called what is it, uh, Sean? SAP Map by Volcano. There you go. Yeah, so that's it. And what they're ultimately going to do is, is to integrate this into Afaria. So they have an app store and all that, so it'll be very clean integration. That's the ideal approach, we, we think, is to have it all cleanly integrated because we don't think users want to look at different pieces of glass to configure something. Just go to Afaria, download the app, and have it automatically apply to security. It's against Active Directory. Yes, please. So, so you're focusing on the own device kind of mindset where they bring their own device, you have them distribute an app. What what happens in the case where the customer brings their own device, you secure the app, but also you want to make sure that because they're using that device to within your space to you said you couldn't control any of the native apps that were already installed on but what about the features? Like for example, let's say I'm a large bank or investment institution 
customer brings their own device, we, we, we allow them to do that, but then we want to do geofencing to make sure that they're not taking pictures while they're out in the trading floor or something like that. Will your software allow us to do that? No, that, that element of it. So we couldn't control the cameras of the phone. We couldn't use an app. Any sort of enterprise data, though, that's coming to the app will not leave that enterprise app. So we would still have to restrict physical security then at that point. Yes. Come here the phone. Say that. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, so let's say um, from a personal standpoint on your own device, you've got something like Evernote on there. Yes. Can can you continue using it for your own personal stuff? Yes. That's what's beautiful about this, <coughs> that you have, you can have your, you can have your corporate version of Evernote, and you can have your personal version of Evernote, and the IT department can't snoop on your personal activity. They can't look at your Angry Birds <coughs> high score and see you. They, they, they have, it's completely separate, but the corporate Angry Birds, they have control over. They can wipe the high score off. They can do whatever they want to them. <laughs> <laughs> So you have two application icons, one for... Yeah, you'll see that we just we'll put a little overlay icon on the app to indicate it's been wrapped. And and so we make that mod that simple change to it. You can actually customize it. You could have your own, uh, you could put your corporate logo on it. It's like a, your work for Bank of America that logo or, or, you know, or Morgan Stanley, I should say, um, logo on that. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Do you have the concept of a single site for the apps? So we do. So this is, I didn't get, because I didn't know how much time I was going to have, but App Federations, and this is something we just released, it's the ability to be able to have a group of apps, apps all run as separately as they do normally. It's the same native experience, but only these apps can share data amongst each other. So you can, and they're from you and they, from your organization. So, and you can have multiple federations, but the federations cannot talk to each other. So in a DOD sense, I may work for the NSA and I may work for the Navy. So those would not be able to, to, to be able to see each other, their data. If they couldn't commingle data, they'd be separated into these different federations. Um, now the, feder the federation also allows for single sign-off into the federation and the policies. Um, okay, I don't know what's happened to me, but I guess it's fine. Um, so we'll go look at this uh, federation here. And we can, we can see the apps that are within the federation. And this federation is very small. It's only one app. But we can also have the federation of policies. And we can apply this so we can have a group. All the apps have to have the same policy. The reason why we do that, we didn't want someone to shoot themselves in the foot. So let's say that four of the five apps had data rest encryption, but the fifth one didn't. As an attacker, all I need to do is slide data from one of the protected four to the one, the one of the five that's unprotected and have a data leak. So you have to be consistent about when you create the federation, they all have the exact consistent policy to prevent any sort of attacks. Are those dynamic policies? They're static in this release. Uh, at this point, every, if they're statically defined. We are working on dynamic uh, policy updates. So you be able to, in the field, you could say change those, those settings. So the person's moved from, let's say, a sales engineer to a salesperson. The rule change, the policy may change with that change. Can you blacklist in the app store so that they don't download an unwrapped version of the same application? No, but it doesn't matter. And the reason why it doesn't matter is because if, if an app didn't come from you, it doesn't have any corporate data in it. So I'm using that, I cannot connect to the VPN in order to get the information in it, so sort of seed it, the valuable information to do anything. If the apps were self-aware and they could generate their own ideas and thoughts and come up with lots of cool data, then I would be worried, but because they have to subscribe to that from somewhere, it doesn't matter. It's not an attack that you have to worry about. Time for one more. One more question. Yes. What's listening on the server side to terminate all those VPN tunnels? Any sort of standard VPN. Um, I don't know if I can mention this. I'm getting all the secrets out a little bit. Maybe not this one, but but we are. Um, there's something that we're working on around that that you'll Checkpoint hear about. Cisco? Cis yeah, we're members of what's called the VPN consortium. And so Cisco, Juniper, Checkpoint, um, any really name brand VPN is a member of this consortium. So we'll interoperate with all of those VPN servers. Just so. And we, we're in 500 million handsets, so you know that we have a, uh, we are the standard for clients of VPNs uh, that no one knows about. <laughs> <laughs> one more? One more? Awesome. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.